I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. And I'm Lorenzo Rodriguez. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's east side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. Good morning and welcome to What's Next. I am your host today, Lorenzo Rodriguez, and this is a special one. This is, I mean, they're all special, but this one's special to me because uh, I'm, I'm with two individuals I've been meaning to speak to for some time now. Early on, when, when this show was Buffalo, what's next? I had met Jose, and, and I said, "Hey, we got to we got to do something in the near future." And and now it's here, and we're adding a, yet a third voice, an important voice here, because we're in the midst of, of Hispanic Heritage Month. But when we talk about Hispanos, Latinos, all of us from the Caribbean and, and, and South America and Central America, there's another component there. We're a very complicated grouping. Uh, and in particular, when you look at the indigenous population of South America and Central and in the Caribbean. And today we're going to focus on the Taino culture um, and, and said locations. And I'm here today with Beatriz Flores, the director and founder of El Bate, her husband Jose Flores, founder and head coach of Takeover Jiu Jitsu, and Miguel Sague Jr. He's a vejique in, in the Taino culture and El Bate. And, and what you're doing here is just a celebration and, and an education of the, of the Taino culture. Uh, but with that said, I, I, I'm thrilled that we're doing this because it's been a while that I've been wanting to speak to you both. And now, Miguel, you, you three have been working together That's already. And now I'm working with you and I'm, I'm, this is thrilling. But Miguel, you're joining us from afar from the land of Pennsylvania. But you're originally from Santiago de Cuba. Uh, That's Beatriz correct. And, and Jose, you are both from Puerto Rico. Correct. And the first question, the first place, the natural place we have to start off is, what are two Puerto Ricans doing in Western New York? And in Miguel, in your case, what is a Cuban doing in the Midwest? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to step on, on uh, Beatriz and Jose's uh, toes here, but I know a little bit because I, I, I grew up in, in the, on the southern shore of Lake Erie, which is essentially where you are. And I know a little bit uh, about the history of the Puerto Rican influx into the, the region because I was there when it was happening in the 1960s. Uh, I came to the United States in 1961, moved to Erie, Pennsylvania in 1962. And uh, uh, by the late 60s, early 70s, I was working with an organization called Minority Health Education Delivery System in, in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we were providing services to Puerto Rican migrant workers mm -hmm. who were working mostly the grapes on the, along the southern shore uh, of Lake Erie, uh, the area called uh, North, Northeast, which is just Northeast uh, as, the, uh, as the name suggests in that area, just uh, east of Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, there was, there's a lot of grape vineyards you know, all along that area. And I know that they extend in, right across the border into uh, New York State. And the, the, these people were coming from uh, Puerto Rico, that were been, being brought in from Puerto Rico to work that. And a lot of them, some of them went back after the, the uh, work was done, but some of them stayed, a lot of them stayed. And they created these communities along the southern shore of Lake Erie, all the way from Cleveland, moving west to uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and then uh, Buffalo, New York, and uh, Niagara Falls. Now, me, I came for a different reason. We left Cuba because of the uh, revolution. My parents were not in favor of the communist, the new communist government that took over in 1959, and we moved uh, to the United States in 1961. Uh, my father uh, was a teacher in Cuba. And he was uh, working with a uh, employment agency that got him a job, secured a job for him in Erie. And that's how we ended up in Erie in 1962. That's where I grew up. That's where I went to high school. That's where I graduated from college at a college that you may or may not have heard of called Gannon University. In, uh, and that's where my father was a teacher. He was a professor, Spanish professor at Gannon University. 
and that's where and that's where I came. I I had always had this interest in indigenous culture, you know, from from my ancestors. But in Erie, I came in touch with with uh, some of the local indigenous people of this area, which are the Senecas, and that also helped to develop my own interest in my own people. And Jose and Beatriz, how did you guys end up well, here in this place? Bueno, si. Este, I came to Buffalo, I think it was in the 90s, early, early 90s. I was a teenager. My mother brought me, not that I came by choice. This wouldn't, this, this wouldn't have been We're going my to America. Right, that's how it is. <laughs> um, um, and, and we were poor, you know, and that's that's what we were doing. We were looking for, for jobs, the industrial scene, the, the steel plants, the factories. Um, and I wasn't here long. We were here for about a year. It was a culture shock for me, um, coming from the island being surrounded by family, my grandmother, my aunts, my cousins, and then being isolated. And then walking into the educational system here that's very similar to, I don't know, an uh, institution that's very domineering, where in Puerto Rico everything was oriented around community. The teachers were like your aunts. So um, we weren't here long. We went back um, and then returned when I was like maybe 20. And I've been here since. Um, yeah. What about you, Jose? Um, I am third generation Puerto mm -hmm. Rican, so my gr my um, grandparents came here um, from Puerto Rico. I'm still up into in debate whether they're from <laughs> uh, from um, Aguadilla, Naguabo, or Aguadilla. But growing up, my mother had a huge Puerto Rican family, so I was a, a immersed in Puerto Rican culture and um, family community, and um, as being the first to go to higher ed, I was immersed in higher education and it became a different world for me. And I was isolated from my culture for a, t a long time and um, it wasn't um, until I became educated about Puerto Rican history and culture that I made this way back to say, okay, we need to become more aware of um, our identity and get connected with other Puerto Ricans in, in an effort to bring back community and been here we are doing and that. Here we are. We're at El Bate, mm -hmm. the, the organization, the, the location, the center that Beatriz, you founded, and Jose, where you teach your jujitsu, you teach bomba. We're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. um, and give us a little bit of history of how, I mean, you kind of touched on it, but how you founded the center and why it was so important to highlight the Taino culture, which is African and indigenous roots of the Caribbean here. Correct me if I'm wrong, Taino people have presence in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Jamaica, among other places. It's, yes. it's, all, it's all throughout the, the Caribbean. Caribbean yeah. um, but what made you say, we need to do this here in Western New York? And so, why? Yes, absolutely. So part of it was that, that, that sense of community was lost. It's lost. Um, and like Jose mentioned, going to higher ed, me becoming a nurse, I was even more isolated from my community, my immediate community here. I've been here for a while now. Um, having my kids not speaking Spanish, losing the language, mm -hmm. looking for a place that would host our culture, that would protect our culture, that would teach our traditions, and there was nothing. And I was baffled because this is a largely Puerto Rican community. I was like, how is it that we don't have a cultural center? How is it that we have nothing that we can connect back um, to, to tie up to the language, the traditions, the music, everything, everything that makes us us? Um, and then I was in a position that was no longer in survival mode. I was no longer poor. We were working, and we were like, we looked at each other. We we're like, it's time to get back. So that's how El Bate, we started working at a small pilot program at McKinley High School with kids for mm -hmm. Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, Cause that's when like all the bosses go and that's when they want to know about us and they want to hear us, you know. <laughs> it's so, we're Hispanic exacto, 24 hours, seven days a week, toda la vida, yeah. and and, and it, <laughs> hey, we'll take it. We'll, exactly. We'll, 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 Anytime let's, we let's get talk. to show off a little bit exactly. more, absolutely. Um, so I started that small pilot, doing music, doing bomba, doing a little bit of playing. Now we did bachata. It was very generic, um, and it, it made me go into a deep dive of really finding out who I was, um, really looking for um, the history tied to that music. And then I found a universe, which is Bomba. Um, and Bomba is mostly directly connected to the history, the black history of Puerto Rico that was kept from us. Um, and then doing that deep dive, I come to realize that we can, we can go further. And that's where the Taino search and the Taino fostering that culture too came into place. Um, that's how I connected with Miguel. And we've done projects and we're, I feel like we're just scratching the surface and getting reconnected and taking it back to where we're indigenizing our thoughts, our hearts, our way of life, the things that we do. Um, moving away from that centralizing the American way and the, 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 the whiteness of it all. That's so dominant in our, you know, in our everyday life. There's so much there to unpack and I, oh I can't God. wait to get into it because, <laughs> as you mentioned, one of the big things that's taught here 
is bomba and bomba in itself is it's gone through a metamorphosis it's oh, gone, yeah. you yeah. mentioned it it, it it has the the drums and the and the sounds of, of indigenous roots yes but then it became almost like correct me if i'm wrong kind of music of resistance it is when when slaves were brought over to the, the spanish islands and and then you have the beautiful i say beautiful because you saw you started seeing a genesis of new of new cultures arising from all these different mm -hmm. cultures that came together in this area of, of the world but it, it went from indigenous roots to to afrocentric mm -hmm. uh, uh stylings and it's it a real snapshot of the cultures that eventually populated puerto rico mm -hmm. cuba like all the other islands i mentioned but what what can you tell me about bomba i have some some phrases here that i, that uh -huh. I, I will ask you if we don't get to them <laughs> but i'm curious what, what in your words what is bomba and and then subsequently plena for me uh personally bomba is a lot and it's, it's a lot about community but it's also very introspective you have to do a lot of uh, like inward work um and a lot of self-discovery so for me it's liberation that's the word that comes to mind um but uh, uh i don't know happy meal answer that we get you know we can give everyone because it's, it's 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 deep in in, in history um, it is uh, the oldest tradition that Puerto Rico has, oldest musical tradition. It dates back to the 1600s. There's documentation on it. They, they can say there were drums and they were recorded, they were re um, written about it. Um, so that's as far as they can, they can find documentation on it. The, the, the description of esos negros bailando bomba con unos tambores. So there's do documentation back to the 1600s. And it is rooted in Africa. It's, it was rooted in African rhythms. Um, but it, it, it emerged as Puerto Rico emerged as a, as a nation. Um, so it's not solely African, although it's very rooted in African rhythms. It's like fragments of mm -hmm. what Africans had in, back in their home country. Um, very and then, drum heavy, right? Very. It's all percussion. But also, yeah, percussion. It has some major flute. percussion. Yeah, no, no flute. No flute. Mm -mm, that's indigenous. Um, what it has uh, that that it does come from the indigenous is the maraca. Okay. A single a single maraca, and it's it's made out of iguera. Um, the quas, which are like the two palitos that play the the tempo. Um, it's argued that it's indigenous or it could be African as well because you can find that in African traditions too. So it's a very a heavy, heavy African indigenous guided tradition, um, which it, it makes what we are. And what it's beautiful is that it doesn't center the European aspect of it because um, that we were conditioned to think Spain first, everything else, you know, later, and then um, our nationality comes before everything else. But this is this is a black tradition. This this was rooted by Puerto Ricans, descendants of the enslaved people that were taken from Africa. So it's a very, very beautiful, very history-guided tradition that we just have to. We have to take the responsibility to pass it down. Once again, and you teach classes here on Bomba. I don't oh, know yes. if, if folks are hearing the, the steps. The, the, uh -huh. the, uh, but <laughs> be, be, uh, next door to us is a full-fledged full class of uh, Bomba students. But it, the, what I loved about learning about Bomba was the, the give and take between the Buleador mm -hmm. and the primo. You did right? your work. <laughs> there's a there's a drummer and a dancer. Uh -huh. There's a there's almost like a synchronization and a relationship between yeah. the two, where like the drummer takes the lead of the dancer because the dancer and there's a relationship there. A huge you have to you have to greet the the drummer uh -huh. and then the drummer kind of takes the, the rhythm and pace from the, the dancer based on whether they're doing the sika, which is like a, a toe tap, sika, uh -huh. sika uh -huh. a paseo, which is a little bit, uh, I don't know, I can't, I'm trying to uh, convey, <laughs> you but got a good it's like a little it. swing yeah. and, 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 and a groove, and then it, la carre, carrerita, la carrerita, That's carrerita. The steps. Yeah. Uh, I gotta roll those R's, my mom would kill me if, if not, you better if you're from carrerita, Ahí está. She would be rápido proud. corren los carros por el ferrocarril, <laughs> Uh, I mean, our, 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 our Anglo friends are gonna are gonna get their heads are gonna be in a whirlwind here. But yeah, it's filled with identity. It's, yes, it's, it's a very intricate, um, interconnected mechanism that creates beautiful synergy, that builds community, that creates intimacy, that creates a space for expression. Uh, so you have the drummers, and everybody has a role to play. So it's very community driven because you have to know your place, you have to know your role, you have to come in to contribute. So the drummers you have, you can play bomba with two drums or thirty. Um, you have the lead drummer, which is the one that does the interpretations of mm -hmm. the dancer. And then you have the buleadores, like you mentioned, and they maintain, they're like the foundation. They maintain that rhythm. Um, so that leads way to a singer with a maraca who leads the bate, the open bate, okay. um, which is the, the space where the dance happens and the bomba happens. 
Um, and then you have the community itself, the Dos de Coro. So everybody's called to, to join and participate and then just create beautiful energy. The word bate means gathering space, correct? Bueno, sí. Este, Miguel can explain because it, it is an indigenous word. I was going to say, yeah. And it's please. interesting that you find it in Bomba, um, that you know, it was adopted into Bomba because Bomba reflects the times of Puerto Rico. So 500 years of Puerto Rico, 450 of Bomba, then you have a big story to tell. Explain the word bate. In, in, bate. In, so... Bate is a term that's used for a large cleared field in some places, especially in Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, it was lined with standing stones that were stuck in the ground so that they would stand up. And sometimes these stones were decorated with drawings that were carved into the stone, uh, scratched into the stone. And these large, some of them were rectangular, some of them were circular. And so inside the Bate, there would be dances that would be performed and other ceremonies. So the name Bate has remained, has survived to this day for any place where you have a ceremony. It was adopted by later people who came after the Tainos, people of mixed blood, Taino, African, and Hispanic, which is what uh, most of our population mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, uh, in the Spanish language Caribbean is. Uh, and they have adopted that word for similar spaces for any place where you can gather you know mm -hmm. now in cuba and dominican republic the word is also used for a place where there's a, a housing like a, a a rural housing area where there's all the houses of the people that work in the sugarcane fields they live in a in a kind of like a village situation with a big open space uh and, and all the houses are around so the the word bate is used for the whole ensemble, not just the open space, but also the houses around it, which kind of reflect the way ancient Taino uh, villages were built. They were also built of wooden and, and thatch, palm thatched to roofed houses built around big open spaces, either circular or rectangular. So that's, that's the whole bate thing. And like I mentioned, we're, we're here at El Bate mm -hmm. in Tonawanda. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, I, I, I think I got the idea here, village, community, gathering space. Mm -hmm. the, the idea, the concept of bringing people together and both Beatriz and Jose, you guys bring a number of people together, not, not just Puerto Ricans, the Hispanic people in the area, uh, everybody in the area with so many different components to El Bate. There's on Saturdays, I think you do, there's a marketplace mm -hmm. set up where, where where folks, uh, vendors come, food, La food placita. vendors, uh -huh. La Placita, uh -huh. uh, and Jose, you have jujitsu that you teach here as well. How does that, how does that go into the whole aspect of the mission of it? Our kids program is from five to 12 years old, and then we do teens um, as well, and they're in our young adults, so we keep kids so they're young adults, like 21, 22, mm -hmm. we have 23 years my old. My old head can, can end up in a class. Absolutely. Yeah. If I look 21, I can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, so we do have adult programming as well, but the kids program really, um, the origins of it was around El Bate. Beatriz wanted to bring visibility to Puerto Rican culture and history. So in her efforts to do that, she, it was, it was grassroots, so she was at, with them face to face. And she realized that they have other needs too. Some kids are being bullied in school, mm -hmm. language barriers, kids are being made fun of because they, they're not bilingual. There, there could be a, an array of other issues around, struggling around mental health. And we started to realize that there are other needs. So we brought in another person that was passionate about um, jujitsu, myself, and we started teaching, teaching jujitsu to the kids. Uh, as, a, as another resource, but we always really centered it around Puerto Rican culture and history. Finding, as, finding as that first. identity that when you are in a, in a place where you're not the predominant nationality, yeah. culture, yeah. ethnicity, what have you, it's, for me, I can say that it's been great meeting mm -hmm. folks like yourselves here in, in Western New York because I came, I came here a year ago and before then it was it was seven years before that that I was in, in, in my hometown in uh -huh. Miami, but there was a lot more more of us down there. Uh, so it's been every time that I run into someone of, of just a shared language. Yeah, is shared huge. experience. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's great that, that you, you all have created a, a place here where where people feel welcome. I, I, I felt welcome that day when I came to the Placita. <laughs> I still feel welcome today. Miguel, you are welcomed here. You've done, you guys have collaborated, yes, correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. Even, you've, let, me, you've, let, me, let me tell you how this works. 
before El Bate, I knew that there was always a Puerto Rican community there in Buffalo, in Erie, Pennsylvania, in Cleveland, Ohio, the whole southern shore of Lake Erie. And the Taino Resurgence Movement is now relatively mature. It started in the 1990s, and then it really evolved in the 2000s and so forth. But it's mostly centered around New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia. So there are large popula Puerto Rican and, and uh, Caribbean, Spanish language Caribbean populations in other places. But for some reason, the Taino Resurgence Movement had not coalesced in these places. And I was living here in the western area of the east. I was more interested in seeing this develop here, you know, among us. So one of the things that I did is I created a Facebook page called Lake Effect Tainos. I've been <laughs> working. I've been reaching Love out it. to my brothers and sisters in Erie, in Cleveland. I've gone to Cleveland, Puerto Rican Day Parade. We set up a Taino booth. There was some interest, but it's never really taken off. And, you know, I can't do it long distance. I'd have to, you know, if there are people living in the place, you know, there that are interested, that really take this into their hands. And the same thing with Cleveland. I knew people that lived in Cleveland. I said, you guys are got to get this, but nothing. And then one beautiful day, my friend Lisa here in Pittsburgh tells me, Miguel, do you know that there's an organization in Buffalo that's putting together a Taino event? And I said, a what? <laughs> in Buffalo? A Taino <laughs> event? Who is this? Who are these wonderful people? And so she shows me the material online. I said, let's just go. Let's crash this yeah. event. Okay. <laughs> so, so we got in the car. She drove. We showed up out of nowhere. These folks, these beautiful folks were not expecting us. They didn't know we were That's coming. True. Okay. <laughs> so we showed up with regalia, with Taino regalia. The brown people nice showed up. See that they were in regalia. They were wearing the feathers. They were wearing you the white clothes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. This is awesome. They had stones that looked like the stones at Caguana Ceremonial Center yeah. with the inscribed uh, petroglyphs. I said, whoa, mind blown. <laughs> So uh, I start asking, uh, who can I talk to somebody here? And everybody starts saying, oh, you got to find Beatrice. Beatrice. <laughs> <laughs> Where is this Beatrice? Somebody point her out. And we went, and she was so sweet and, and, and welcoming. These, these are like strangers coming out of nowhere, crashing the party, OK? And they, they let us set up a, a little space where I could tell my stories. And uh, from then on, we have been fast friends. And yeah. so they, that happened last year. I came back this year. We had a great time, even with the raindrops. And I don't care if it rained. It was awesome anyway. Uh, so it, it, that's, that's, what, that's what this is. And now here we are. Uh, but you came up here for the Areto Old Ceremony. And so in regards to that, and also as a recognized Bejique in the Taino culture, explain what all that means for, for those that well, are you not know, One of the most important elements of the Taino tradition is our ancient origin narratives, our, our creation stories. Okay, that's a very important part. It's one of the first things that we ask people that are just beginning to learn uh, and come into their own in their Taino ancestry is learn the creation narratives. And Jose and uh, uh, Beatriz mm -hmm. were kind enough to allow me a space where I could tell these these time, which are very interesting, and, and they really uh, they attract the attention of children, of course, because a lot of Native American creation stories are are really attractive to children. So they let me sit there and tell my weave my stories, you know, and that is that is a wonderful introduction into the culture. Whether you later want to become, I mean, not everybody is interested in Taino spirituality. A lot of a lot of uh, modern day. Uh, Puerto Ricans are Christians, and some of them are even Muslims. So there, there are other different uh, spiritualities, and we we well, we feel that all of them are legitimate expressions of who we are as uh, as uh, uh, Latinx people and uh, Hispanic people. But of course, if anybody's interested in the ta the original Taino spiritual tradition, I'm more than happy to share that. Uh, and, uh, and and with that, that's something that's being part of my life forever. Well, I mean, you mentioned it. it it's it's we're, we're part of a rich palette of, of colors. There's so many influences that comprise the moniker, the, the, the name. 
of Hispanics, Latinos, Latinx, everything. Like, it's just a a, a hodgepodge. Like, we're, but but when you go down to the root of it, it's the passing. Now we're all we're all. I think we could all say in agreement. All whatever uh, Caribbean or South American nationality you're from, the concept of family and and tradition and passing down oral traditions and it's something that like. Everyone has a good has a good cuento to tell. Mm-hmm. I, I love the idea of like passing down oral traditions because it it, it also puts the elders at the center. Mm-hmm. Which in today's technology world, most kids are going to their phone to find answers. Mm-hmm. But to have everyone in a bate and center our elders to say, yo, they have value, they have wisdom to share. Listen to the stories that they heard. Mm-hmm. That passing down is just. It's beautiful, yeah. and I think it's, it, it does center some of the... Um, and my connection to Miguel is one... That, that's one of the biggest... My biggest treasures is that we have an elder that's willing to, to go the extra mile to see this community grow. Um, and, Driving and, all the way up from Pittsburgh. Exactly. I know. And, and, and no questions asked. Nothing, nothing, asking for nothing in return. Like, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. And then I, just to see the kids surrounding him when he does his stories, kids, adults, and multi-generationals. Like, we, we get to bring... Anytime we do anything about they... You see the grandparents, mm-hmm. you see the dads, you see the moms, you see all, you see everyone because everyone's so interested in what the kids are doing and what the kids are, you know, are learning. And then the, so, the the impact reverberates. It doesn't stay with the kids. We're 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 youth center. We're focused on, on teaching the the young, the youth, but we're also connected with the elders in Bomba in Puerto Rico, and, and now that we're trying to develop a Taino um, community as well. I'm so lucky to have an elder to call to and ask questions. So, yeah. For once, the internet actually gave us something good here. Exactly. <laughs> connect the people. Yeah. Yeah. Connect the people for the right reasons. Yeah. For the good. You wow. know, it, does, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt that the bate, el bate is so musical oriented because mm-hmm. I'm a musician. And I, I led a salsa band during the whole decade of the 90s here in Pittsburgh. We had, we had a, a local salsa band that played uh, all the festivals and everything like that. And so I know about Bomba. I know about Plena. We played plenty of plena. We didn't play any bombas because that's a whole, that's a very specific kind of thing. But we played, I mean, you have to really know your stuff to Mm -hmm. to, to do bomba. Mm -hmm. But we did perform some plenas. My band was called Guaracha Latin Dance Band, and we played plenas. And that was a lot of, it was fun to to play that, that, that. uh, pandereta, you know? Pandereta. Well, you said it. You you got handed down the gift of music from your parents. Mm-hmm. Your father, yes. Your professor father, also <laughs> apparently loved musicals. He was a music freak. <laughs> he he loved. He wasn't much of a singer. My mother was a better singer than he was. But he loved to whistle, and I introduced. That. I, I inherited that from him. It's I an whistle art. It's an all art the form. time. I don't care what people say. It's instrument sing. I get to play. I'm pretty good <laughs> whistler. <laughs> I play the guitar and I sing. I I sang. Uh, for some time when I was a child in, in, in Erie, uh, I was in, uh, in the uh, church choir there in, in the Erie's uh, St. Peter's Cathedral. And uh, then, of course, I, 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 I sang with my band, Guaracha, in Pittsburgh. And that the beauty of this thing is to see the similarities, certainly the contrast, the, the, the differences and the similarities between the beautiful music of my own country, of Cuba, and the music of uh, Puerto Rico, and to see how they, it, salsa is, salsa itself is a phenomenon where these two forces join together because salsa is, it originated from, from roots of Cuban music, but it was, but it evolved in a Puerto Rican milieu, mm-hmm. you know, mostly mm-hmm. in New York City. So that in itself, the whole salsa movement is a very beautiful meshing of the two uh, traditions, which Jose Marti called Las Dos Alas del Mismo Pajaro, mm-hmm. you know? Love del it. Mismo Pajaro, Las Dos Alas. Love From it. the dropping, same bird. Dropping some Marti on wings. us. <laughs> yeah, of course. You have to. If we're, we're talking culture, we're going to talk about the, the, the poet laureate of our island. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm speaking. That's why the Puerto Rican flag and the Cuban flag are so similar. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is perfect. Good segue here. But first and foremost, let me remind folks who we're speaking with here. I'm speaking with Beatriz and Jose Flores. The, the founders of El Bate and Takeover Jiu-Jitsu, and then also Miguel Sague Jr., the Be- uh, Bejique of the, and founder, I forgot to mention this, you are founder of the Kine Indigenous Spiritual Circle. You brought up the flag, and you brought up music, and something that I, f- I found interesting in, in researching for this is that bomba music was banned, or bomba in itself was banned, and, and it got some pushback. 
in yeah. Puerto Rico, correct? Yeah, for, 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 for centuries. So yeah, so Bomba is 400 years old, uh, 450 years old. And with that, it, it, it's, it's moving and evolving and uh, providing a space for community for the most marginalized. But in the same sense, it's giving them a voice. Um, so they, you would have to be hidden to do Bomba in the times of colonial rule from Spain. Mm -hmm. um, it was prohibited. So some um, of the uh, plantation owners will allow it more than others. So it was able to survive that like, clandestine manner for, for a lot of years. Um, once we, we see Puerto Rico being evolved into um, a more industrial, you know, more modernized, Bomba is still in the, in the marginalized area. So in the 1950s, in comes Rafael Cepeda, which is known as the patriarch of Bomba, and um, the father of Bomba. Even though there was like, step, prior to him, there were several families that, that had patriarchs and matriarchs of Bomba maintaining clandestine, in a clandestine way, the, the tradition. And he comes and brings it to the forefront. So I kind of like follow in, in, in his step foot in Buffalo that we had nothing, nothing to, I had no, no path to follow. So um, I wanted to bring it to the forefront, much like he did. So he brings it up to the for forefront, makes it, uh, creates such an impact that Bomba became like a symbol of Puerto Rican identity at the time. And this, these are black men and women, um, proud, everything centered around their families. They have been doing Bomba for um, eight or nine generations, uninterrupted. Um, so it's beautiful. So politically, Bomba played a, a, a space of resistance because they refused to, to adapt to the conditions. Mm -hmm. They refused to not be who they were. Um, they maintained and protected the, 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 the traditions, the customs, the way of Bomba, because it's the way of life. Um, so politically, it, 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 it kind of holds a mirror up to, to the government. Um, here we are. We're going to be loud. We're going to be proud. Um, and you're not going to get rid of us. Um, and it, it's exploded. I mean, if you move it forward politically, to Hurricane Maria, to the expulsion of our ex-governor. Bomba was in the forefront, in, 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 the, in the picket lines, mm. screaming, singing, dancing. Uh, it, it was part of the resistance. The, the music has a message to, to it tell. Does. It tell. It gives voice to the voiceless. But, uh, yeah, the, the Puerto Rican flag was banned, too. I didn't know that until, yes. until recently. Then, that Then you was, wonder why we're so, <laughs> we're so, with Puerto Ricans on steroids. There's an identity the crisis there, here, yeah. people. No, it had a lighter shade of blue also, that, that yeah. then it switched over. Yeah, it, you think about it. it these, these are all symbols of, of independence, of movement, of liberation, of self-identifying as a nation. And the U.S. doesn't want that. So they're going to suppress it. So all that you're mentioning is rooted on erasure, is rooted on colonialism. It's rooted on us forgetting who we are. And this is where we come into place and become interrupters of that we keep getting we keep coming back to that 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 same motif of there's always someone saying you can't do this you can't do that you're going to follow our rules mm -hmm. and and bomba seems to be forefront at that as and and also when it comes to the the taino identity another thing that that we mentioned about they uh, I, I researched about they they aguaybana yes which is in puerto rico and also uh, the the bate of Caguana, Caguana, which they're all ceremonial centers and, and, and maintained and overseen by the Puerto Rican government, not the Taino people that should lay, uh, stay claim to the, this, yeah. this, uh, it's this land. It's sovereign land that we have no rights to. You, yeah. I mean, you see that also here a lot with, with the indigenous people of the United States. Mm -hmm. How would you describe that relationship between Tainos and the Puerto Rican government? So I think Miguel can speak a little bit more on it because he's super involved in it. I know from, from witnessing, from seeing, from getting involved in it now that, that La Caguana, which was, is a, is a, a ceremonial site, um, a sacred land for the, the practicing Tainos and the descendants of Tainos and the Tainos themselves because we know that we're still alive. There's still families that are direct descendants of Tainos in Puerto Rico that has been proven. Um, they're fighting in the forefront. They, recently, that Caguana was going to be sold, privatized. Um, mm. And the people stood up. The Taino people stood up. There were protests. They made... They, they, they called out the government, the diaspora, us out here, everyone got, got involved. We're signing petitions, everyone's making phone calls. So it's not just, it, we're no longer insulated in like this little island. We're now connecting with the Caribbean itself. In Bomba and, and the Taino heritage, all of those, those traditions and taking it back to the root helps us in maintaining that resistance. Yeah, the, in, in uh, the two, early 2000s, a group of Tainos in uh, Boriquen, we, we like to use the word Boriquen for, for uh, Puerto Rico. It is a Taino uh, word, mm -hmm. Boricua. It's we a say Taino word for the Boricua. Exactly. Para que tú lo sepas. Right. The root is, is indigenous. Yes. Yeah. So the, the Taino people in Boriquen actually uh, um, did a, a, a takeover of Caguana, mm -hmm. an illegal takeover or, or, or takeover of Caguana. And they, they did a sit down. The authorities were brought in. The it was uh, it, it got pretty heated, 
and they are, they actually got the support of the uh, municipal government of the uh, of the town that is nearby, which is Caguana is considered to be part of the municipality of Utuado. And the the actual the mayor of Utuado sided with the Tainos in in inside that taking over Caguana. So it was like a, a a rebellious takeover. And the protest was that uh, it, it had been allowed to go into disrepair. There were things that it, it was uh, allowed to the the uh, the site was was deteriorating and it wasn't being uh, kept up. And it was a, a statement saying, you know, we need for us to have more say in the upkeep of Caguana Ceremonial Center. And now there, there's a little bit, it, it's improved somewhat. Mm -hmm. It isn't as bad as it used to be. There are still some serious complaints among the local Taino community in the island of Boriquen, but uh, we have a little bit more access uh, to the place than we used to. It should be completely in control of Tainos. Taino should be completely controlling it. They're not. Well, but it, still... it seems like it's that's been the government's mo for some time now. Because I mean, I, I read this in the Smithsonian Magazine: sixty-one percent of, of current Puerto Ricans have indigenous Taino DNA. But the Puerto, the Puerto Rican government and historians will claim that nope, the Tainos were eliminated and wiped out after colonization. So you kind of you, you kind of see this this, this subversion going on where it's like nope, it's it's no longer. A, 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 an identity, a, a thing that you claim it is, and what it was doing? an actual study, a, a, a scientific study that was carried out, and I'm sorry to say that I cannot remember the name of the a scientist of the uh, of the uh, genet geneticist who is a Boricua himself, but he proved that Puerto Rico, the people of the of Boricang, uh, uh, some of the highest percentage of indigenous. Uh, DNA survival in the Caribbean are on the island and the archipelago of Boricay, of Puerto Rico. And it's matrilineal. Uh, they found that DNA to be from it's, the mother. It's, yeah. it's through the, uh, uh, the, I can't remember, I'm not really good at this subject of the well, DNA and genetics. As, you have to talk to some of these other people, but it's through the mother. You, yeah. She's right. And as far, I mean, it makes sense when, when uh, it would end up in, in the Puerto Rico being the lar largest concentration because Correct me if I'm wrong, Miguel. The the Tainos were somewhat seafaring. They went from like an Orinoco River region, and then they they went to to Cuba. They went to they went east, mm -hmm. and ended up a, a large population in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, they have they have it in all of the major islands. The reason why I believe that there's such a high percentage of Taino blood in Boricay is because, in my opinion, the Spanish during the colonial period. To a certain extent, they they uh, they there was plenty of colonial settlement in Puerto Rico, but there wasn't as much intensity as in Dominican Republic and Cuba mm -hmm. uh, and some of the other islands. And it allowed for a larger population of of, of Boricuas to uh, Tainos to uh, uh, to live separated, especially in mm -hmm. the mountains. Mm -hmm. There's a, a region in the mountains called Las Indieras, where the people are almost full blood. Mm -hmm. Seriously, and I, I've been there, and I've seen these people. They look like they just walked out of the Amazon <laughs> rainforest. Uh, uh, so it, it's just uh, extraordinary. You go up to the Utuado, to uh, some of those other uh, towns up there, and those people are very, very full blood. We have uh, smaller communities in eastern Cuba that are like that, but nothing like what you find in that area of, of, of Borinquen. And uh, unfortunately, like with many co colonized countries, there's just it's a history of, 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 of indigenous people that, that is fraught with with unfortunate events and turmoil. We have an event in this country that now is Indigenous Peoples Day. It's coming up in this month mm -hmm. and or formerly known as Columbus Day. That name that name has to conjure up a lot of ill feelings because the Taino people are the people that first encountered the Spanish that, that arrived here in, in what was believed to be the Indies. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and he basically exterminated the culture and the way of life of the Taino. That's 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 what the, pre, the, the, the Puerto Rican historians say. That's what so what, what government would say. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've, I've heard reference to as the Caribbean Holocaust. Yeah. Am I am I correct in this characterization? I would say so. Yes. Yeah. And you know, uh, we 
the we have this phenomenon that I, as I said earlier, it began in the early 1990s. Uh, the roots of it were fomenting even before that in the 70s and 80s. But in the 1990s, it just blew up. It exploded when people started when they were going to be celebrating the the 500th anniversary of the uh, anniversary of the arrival of Columbus in the Caribbean uh, in 1492. In 1992, this this effervescence just exploded and created something called the Taino Resurgence Movement. Mm -hmm. And some of the most important, I I myself participate in an organization uh, of the Taino Resurgence Movement called the, the uh, United Confederation of Taino People, led by uh, a leader by the name of uh, Roberto Mucaro Borrero. And it, it, this organization has accomplished an incredible amount in bringing to the forefront, not only among Tainos, but to the whole indigenous communities of the world and even in the United Nations. He has represented us in the United Nations in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the UCTP, the United Confederation of Taino People, is an amazing phenomenon of the Taino resurgence movement. And I'm very proud to represent them also. I was going to bring that up towards the end because out of this this ordeal, something a resurgence, as you mentioned, it has 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 come up, come out. Uh, you mentioned the the quincentennial anniversary of, of the Spanish voyage of Columbus to the New World, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, but you you started a you started participating in something called the Run of the Peace and Dignity Journeys, and I want that also happened at that time. That right. began at the same time at around 1992. As the it was like hey. We are also part of the story, and, and we're yeah. going to show you what we're going to do. And you've been doing this now for a few years. It's every four years that this takes place, correct me if I'm wrong. Every four years. Uh, yeah. A group of people, yeah, explain indigenous what it is. people, they meet, they gather together in Alaska, in the northernmost part of North America. And from there, they, they gather together, and they bring, put these together, these staffs. And the staffs are very symbolic. They're these staffs that have feathers attached to them. And each one represents an indigenous community, not just Tainos, but all these indigenous communities. It was originally started by North American indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Tainos didn't join till later. Uh, so you had Lakotas from South Dakota. You have uh, Haudenosaunee from the Iroquois people of the New York State. You had people from out west, some, uh, some of the Mexicas, uh, who are the mm. Mexican descendants of the Aztec people. They join together and they all go up to Alaska and then they start running. This is wild. Running. This is when I found this out. Running, thought, Lorenzo. This was the wildest <laughs> thing ever, and I but I love they it. They because... start running. What? And they, they, it's, it's two parts, by, right? So, huh? It's a, it's two different dis, uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, get sorry, to that. I'm, jumping, I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> <laughs> they are accompanied by support vehicles where they have fresh runners who take over whenever a group gets three or four that are carrying these staffs. And uh, they come in, and they got another group comes out, almost like a relay race. Mm. And guess what? The same thing happens in South America. Mm. And now the people that are in North America, they're running south. The ones that start at the uh, they start from tip so of South America are running north. So they're running up from Argentina, they go through Chile, they're running through Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and they get more and more people added on. Same thing, they got uh, uh, support vehicles with food and places, uh, and then they set up places where they're going to stay for the night, and the com indigenous communities that they pass along the way support them, and they give them p uh, food to eat. And then after months of this, Lorenzo, they all meet at a central place. It's been, until now, it's been Central America. They they met in Mexico. Sometimes they meet in Mexico. Sometimes they meet in, in Panama Guatemala. City. This, huh? I, I, so I did, I, I had to look up all I could on this and it was because it was just remarkable. Um, yes. It's about a seven month journey from Chicaloon, Alaska. And, and, and then the other group starts from like Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, there's always a prayer attached to the to the event. That's and right. Whether it's responsibility, lots and lots of prayer and ceremony to the land, to Mother Earth, Father Sky, uh, the Baton Sagrado, as you mentioned, everyone has a, a sacred staff that represents uh, a, a particular group. 2016's 
uh, Cuban staff was the maroon Taina staff, and always upright. The, the, the importance of connecting land and sky. You're, you don't drink water first, your staff does, and it's never walked backwards. Exactly. Some remarkable they have all these takeaways. rules and uh, regulations that. that you have to keep while they're moving these staffs along their path. And now, Tainos did not start, did not, this has been going on every four years since 1992. Now, Tainos officially began to join this in 2008, okay? So uh, the ironic thing about this, and they, they did not, it was not something that was done on purpose, but it always coincides with an American presidential election because <laughs> they also happen every four years. So 2008, 2012, 2016, and, and there was one that was supposed to happen in 2020, but COVID got in the way. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a, a, a transcontinental event. People are crossing borders and all the borders were closed in 2020. Mm. So we couldn't do it in 2020. So the next one, of course, is next year in 2024. And that's, it's gonna happen at the same time again. And nobody meant to do that. That was on purpose. <laughs> they, they didn't, it just happened, you know? Four, four is a sacred number in most indigenous traditions. So they do it every four years, starting in 1992. You know, it's a it's a remarkable event, and and just like I said, taking a date uh, that has infamy attached to it, and then turning it into a celebration of of, of multiple indigenous peoples, not just not just that, you know everyone, it seems like has has participated in this in one way or another. Um, and we have a few more minutes here. I, I'm very curious on this because we're we're in that celebratory Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm doing the the, the air quotes because <laughs> it's our time in the calendar. But I, I'm curious, of the, the Caribbean, just Hispanos in general, of, mm -hmm. of the Caribbean, you have so many cultures that are part of that, of who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the, the Spanish influence, you got French, you got Dutch, you got some, I mean, and then when you look at Spain, you look at all, like Moors and, and Hebrew, mm -hmm. all the, 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 the bloodlines per se that have, that have flowed through us. Um, when, you sell, when you boil it down to Hispanic sometimes, you don't get the real true essence of what that very rich identity is. Um, some of some of these people also being antagonists to the Taino people. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you see something like that? How do you like? It's great that we're getting identified and, and, and put on the forefront, but is it enough? Is it being done the right way? How are should we be reshaping or looking differently at how we identify as people of the Caribbean? I do agree. Um, I think I think centering the Caribbean narrative is important. Not just Puerto Rico, Cuba, Jamaica. Jamaica mm -hmm. has a huge history and a huge heritage in Taino. Um, when we speak about Taino people, they have Taino people too, Taino heritage. Um, but when it comes to Hispanic Heritage Month and um, the concept of being Hispanic, I don't completely shut it down because we are Hispano hablantes. That's what Hispanic means. Um, and for Puerto Rico specifically, um, speaking Spanish was a form of resistance when the U.S. took over. It's the language of our grandmothers. So it's not that I'm tied to Europe through it, meaning Spain. Mm -hmm. um, I'm tied to that history that affected my grand my grandparents and their parents. Um, and, and it's important because it's because that that still connects us to the land and to the grandmas and to and to the community. So it's, it's a huge part of our identity. So I don't shut it down completely. How the U.S. operates the machine, the, the you know the the, the glitz and the glamour, the, the skirts, the dances. Um, I'm, I take it um, into into I take it very serious. So when we come into this month, I make sure that when we do presentations, they come with a dose of history, reality, almost a lecture. I go deep. I don't sugarcoat. We center blackness and we center indigenous because that is never part of the picture in Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, it's always the the light skinned Latino, you know, light color hair, you know, the standard because you know, and yep. that's that's given to us. So for, for that, that sense, it, it's important because of representation. We want our kids to, to be represented, seen, and because I think about the youth always. So in the schools and in, in, in open spaces, but the people that are bringing forth our stories, they sh it should be us. They should be conscious, and they should take it a step further. So it should be politically charged, or at least informative, um, and it should be back to the roots as deep, as authentic as it can be. Anything outside of that is caricature and it's damaging to us. So it could be our own people that are, you know, our surface level knowledge. So I, I always encourage anyone, more than lecturing them, 
be curious about your own country be curious about go to work don't be lazy about oh let me just dance salsa and not know where it came from let oh reggaeton is the, is the national music of puerto rico i want to mm. i want to lose mm. my mind tu me entiendes? Like, i love bad bunny but it's exacto, not but <laughs> there's it, more it is, there's they take a deeper dive exactly um there's more to who we are don't don't allow someone else tell you who you are so hispanic characters month um i, I put it I, the task is upon the leaders that are in the industries in the music in in the, the salsa bands like don't just do it for a gig have some dignity caramba you know Lorenzo <laughs> when when I think of October 10th 9th that that area of the calendar there mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what we're doing here in this region you know Buffalo Western Pennsylvania Cleveland um, I like to think of it in terms of what we have been calling that time of the year in Latin America, mm. we have been calling it El Dia de la Raza. Mm. And when you call it El Dia de la Raza, you are in act, in fact... Uh, the day of race for, for, mm -hmm. for exactly. English speakers. You're, you're invoking this, this mixture and this blending of traditions from different places. You know, Africa, the indigenous people that originally were in the uh, in the in the in the uh, Latin America in the place that we now call Hispanic America, Latin America, uh, or Latinx, or whatever, uh, and the the Spanish, which uh, uh, Beatriz rightfully mentioned, you can't get away. I play the guitar. Mm -hmm. The guitar was brought here by the Spanish. El you cuatro, can't get away from. Yeah, it. Like, I'm not going to stop playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, so so this is all part of who we are, and we have to recognize it. We have to own it and revel in it and revel in the beauty of this of this yes do i identify as taino yeah i'm a mixed person but i identify as taino but i also also acknowledge the the legacy of spain the legacy of africa and the legacy of these other entities that came into latin america here in western pennsylvania i belong to the council of three rivers american indian center and i represent the council of three rivers american indian center just like i represent the uctp just like i represent the uh Cane indigenous spiritual circle but hey when i dance salsa which i love to dance i know that i am expressing traditions that are coming from all these different directions mm -hmm. at me and i'm loving it i think beatrice summar summarized it well but the only thing i would add is what i love um about El Bate because it's really about education, family, culture, and traditions. And awareness. So it's not, it's yeah. not. The, it's, there is that big component, I think. Yeah. And awareness for us. Yes. Uh, it, it, like the recipients have to be us. Um, I think in Hispanic Christmas Month, we tend to be like, oh, look at our contributions. But to who are we showing that we're worthy? Um, it has to be directed towards our own people. Yeah. We need it the most. But it, for, for El Bate, it's just uh, another month. To be honest with you, yeah, we don't like do we special. live bomba, live the culture, we <laughs> live in community to all, every day be. of the yeah. week. Yeah. So she is looking for a celebration every day of the week. To, <laughs> to, 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 that's, that's the reason that's, we should that's, do, that's that's the the do bomba. That's another reason we should do bomba. That's the one <laughs> thing we can all agree on. I mean, even our, our Anglo friends, our, our, our African American friends, all of us. We love a good party, and we know how to party. <laughs> right. uh, however, in whatever language you you, you put it, uh, we know. Bomba and now play a plena. Como era Miguel Elena Elena. Elena 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 me dijo a mí yo me voy pa los santos pa el pueblo de Manatí yo me voy pa los santos pa el pueblo de Manatí. Check out plena Lorenzo. Check it out. <laughs> I will and all so, the way. So if myself or anyone listening wants to check out some more things about the Taino culture, about El Bate, where can they go? So for El Bate, we are on Facebook, uh, just as that, El Bate, E-L-B-A-T-E-Y. -E it is a Taino word. Um, and then Instagram as well. We're a big presence in social media because that's where everybody spends a lot of their time. <laughs> um, and then we have the families interconnected there. We share a lot of the pictures, a lot of the videos. Any, we have events almost throughout the year. We have classes uh, in a trimester way, like we do. We follow one of the Buffalo Public Schools. So right now we're in the fall semester. There goes the drums. Uh oh. Um, classes in session. Yeah, we have classes all the way from five years old. No, from two years old to uh, 
however old you want to be. But the two-year-old class is very unique because it's mommy and me classes. Mm -hmm. So we have now kids being exposed to music, to the clave, and then to a, a point that he was making that um, he grew up in a musical family. I, I didn't, and, and then I, and that, I always have that in mind. Um, I always try to close the gaps where, where, where are we lacking and where we can come in and, and interrupt it and make it better. Um, and, and that's important because not all of us get to grow up in a musical space, um, and this is a musical space. I couldn't um, tell. Yeah, not right. <laughs> and Miguel? So I also have a, uh, a website, the Kanei, C-A-N-E-Y, Kanei Indigenous Spiritual Circle, where any Taino or any person that self-identifies as Taino can come and learn about our Taino tradition. There is also a wonderful website of the United Confederation of Taino People where you can learn a lot about Taino culture, Taino tradition, and you can even join. You know, you can become a member anywhere you live in the United States or Puerto Rico or wherever. You can become a member, get your own uh, membership card for the United Confederation of Taino People with your name and your and your picture on it. So these are, uh, this is what I, uh, the milieu that I swim around in. Well, I just feel enriched I feel and I feel like my, my cup runneth over because like I said, <laughs> whenever I interact from people from the shared experience that I have, uh, it just, it, it's like the beating drum that's back here. It, it makes my heart beat that much faster. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank Beatriz Flores, Jose Flores, Miguel Sague. Thank you guys so very, very much Gracias. for joining us here on, on Gracias a usted uh -huh. for, for being here on, on What's Next and joining uh -huh. us and talking. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's just like saying amen. Hug, hug. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. You've been listening to What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station. <laughs> <laughs>